Amen. Do you remember me? <laughs> if everybody wouldn't mind standing up, I'll remember it this time. There we go. We start with number two. Aye, we do. If I, if I don't mess up here. Good to have you all here. Good to have you all here. We praise the old God. We praise the old God for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died. place sometimes on the things I forget which one I'm on. <laughs> That's the way it is. <laughs> I 794. 794. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Sorry about that. Four ten she'll be. You guys turn a little faster than I do. So. Hi, four ten. We. He leadeth me. He leadeth me. Oh, bless.
for the for the table. Where? When we when I survey the curse. When I survey the Hawa and Most of you probably know I'm not much of a public speaker, but uh, anyway. Uh, if you're anything like me, you need a reminder every once in a while. And <clears throat> so this morning I was, I drafted Dennis and Cardell here to help me up here. And so I kind of thinking, okay, what am I gonna say? What am I gonna say? And I'm sitting there while Craig was reading something and <clears throat> trying to think, what am I gonna say? What am I gonna say? And Larry comes walking through with the preparations for the communion. I'm thinking, hmm, I should have remembered that. <laughs> but thanks, Larry. So uh, this might sound kind of like a broken record because I read this pretty often, but it, it's a reminder to me, and I'm hoping it'll be a reminder for all of us. It's out of Luke. And it says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with, is with mine on the table, and the Son of Man will go as it is decreed. But woe to the man who betrays me. I will remember this, please. Okay. Dear Lord, we thank you for what you did the day after that night you first broke that Passover bread with a new meaning for us, that it represents your body which would be broken 
the next day. Lord, we thank you for having so much concern for us that you would leave us things we could do to help remember things along the way. We thank you, Lord, that your son paid that heavy, heavy price for the salvation of us sinful people. Lord, we know he did that while we weren't even born or we were yet in our sins. Lord, help us to be, at the very least, thoughtful of it and appreciative. In his name, amen. Shall we pray? Holy Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time that we have to come together and reflect on your son and the tremendous sacrifice he made on our behalf. We ask that you be with us as we take this fruit of the vine, which to us is his blood shed for us. We thank you so much for your perfect plan of salvation that we might be able to commune with you someday. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
you're still utilizing the blue bowl if you have a contribution to make at this time at your convenience. I always want to make sure everybody's got their Bible for the sermon. Good morning, everybody. I want to apologize to not y'all, but to y'all today. Um, a little behind the scenes information for you. We haven't had internet here at the building for over a month. And so we've been trying, whoever has the best hotspot on their phone, to try and do the stream, and it just doesn't work that well. So if you see me keep talking while I'm frozen, that's why I'm online. And for you guys here in person, you get to see me moving. So <laughs> that's really great. Just got back from the youth rally in Casper. It's still going on. Um, we still have three kiddos over there, and we brought two of them back with us last night. But I think they're having fun. I don't know. Brad and Joel, do you guys have a review? Brad just looking at me like, oh, it's okay. But I wanted to make sure I could get back and, and do Bible class on the sermon today. So we had a great fast trip with those kids on Friday and Saturday. So I want to keep doing uh, what I've been doing. And give me your thumbs up or disapproval if you're tired of this, but I'm going to do one more screw tape sermon, okay? So if that's all right, that's good, and we'll, we'll change it up come May, all right? So one more screw tape sermon. And if you haven't kind of caught what we've been doing, I want to warn you, the screw tape letters is written from the perspective of demons. Always got to give that disclaimer because uh, this is not normal stuff to talk about, right? And it's basically demons talking to other demons, the uncle to the nephew, about how we're going to bring this one man, this patient, to hell. And so it's some pretty deep stuff. And I've, what I've been doing is reading a letter, one of these letters from the screw tape letters, and then preaching some scripture that goes along with that. So today, I want to look at letter number seven, or in the book, chapter number seven of the screw tape letters. Again, these were written by C.S. Lewis back in the 1940s, about 1941, um, in the midst of World War II. And they were originally written as editors, letters to the editor of the local newspaper, and then later compiled into a book. So if you get lost in this old school, long reading from C.S. Lewis, don't fear. I'll try and sum it up, and we'll talk about it right after. So letter seven, or chapter seven from the book. Remember, Wormwood is the apprentice demon, and Screwtape is the master. All right? Chapter seven. My dear Wormwood, I wonder that you should ask me whether it's essential to keep this patient in ignorance of his own existence. That question, at least for this present phase of the struggle, has been answered for us by the high command. Hmm. Our policy for the moment is to conceal ourselves. Of course, we haven't always been told to do so, and we really face a cruel dilemma. When the humans disbelieve in our existence, we lose all of our pleasing results of the direct terrorism and we can make no magicians. On the other hand, when they do believe in us, we cannot make them materialists and skeptics, at least not yet. I have great hopes that we shall learn in due time how to emotionalize and mythologize their science to an extent that is, in effect, belief in us, though it won't be called that name. We will creep in with the human mind as it remains closed to the belief of the enemy, the life force, the worship of sex, and some aspects of psychoanalysis, maybe they will prove to be useful. If once we can produce our perfect work of the materialist magician, this man, not using but worshiping what he calls forces while denying the existence of spirits, then the end of our war might be in sight. But in the meantime, we must obey our orders. I don't think you'll have much difficulty keeping your patient in the dark. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in the patient's mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, it's an old textbook method of confusing them, he cannot believe in you. I had not forgotten my promise, <clears throat> to consider whether we should make your patient an extreme 
patriot or an extreme pacifist. All extremes, except extreme devotion to the enemy, are to be encouraged. Not always, of course, but at this period. Some ages are lukewarm and complacent, and then our business is to soothe them faster to sleep. <coughs> Other ages, of which is the present one, are unbalanced and prone to factions. It is our business to inflame them. Any small coochery bound together by some interest with other men that dislike or ignore, it tends to develop a hothouse of mutual edification. And towards the outer world, a great deal of pride and hatred is enter entertained without shame because this cause is to be impersonal. Even when the little group exists originally for the enemy's own purposes, this still remains true. We want the church to be small. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Not only that fewer men may know the enemy, but also that those who do may acquire the uneasy intensity and defensive self-righteousness that comes with any small clique. The church herself is, of course, heavily defended, and we've never been able to to quite succeed in giving her all the characteristics of a faction. But subordinate factions within her have often produced admirable results. For the parties of Paul and Apollos in Corinth, down to the high and low parties in the church. If your patient can be induced to become some sort of conscientious objector, he will automatically find himself one of the small, vocal, organized, unpopular society. And the effects of this on one so new to Christianity will be oh so good. But almost with certainty, he has had serious doubts about the lawfulness serving in this war before the present war even began. Is he a man of great physical courage so great that he will have no half-conscious misgivings about the real motives of pac pacifism? Can he, when nearly nearest to honesty, no human's very near, feel fully convinced that he's actually wholly desired by the enemy to obey him. If he is that sort of man, his pacifism will probably not do us much good, and the enemy will probably protect him from the unusual consequences of belonging to a sect. Your best plan in this case would be to attempt a sudden, confused, emotional crisis from which he may not emerge, but he will be easily a convert to patriotism. Such things can often be managed. But if he is this man, I take him to be. Try pacifism. Whatever he adopts, your main task will be the same. Let him begin by treating the patriotism or the pacifism as part of his religion. Then let him, under the influence of a partisan spirit, come to regard it as the most important part of his religion. Then quietly and gradually nurse him onto the stage at which religion becomes merely a part of the cause, in which Christianity is valued chiefly for the arguments that can be made for his pacifism or patriotism. The attitude which you want to guard against is one that is treated as obedience. Once you've made it to the, to the world at end and faith uh, as a means, you you have almost won your man. It makes very little difference what kind of worldly end he's pursuing. Provided that meetings, pamphlets, policies, movements, causes, crusades, they matter more to him than prayers and sacraments or charity. He is ours. And the more religious on those terms, the more secretly ours, the more securely ours. I could show you a pretty big cage full of them down here, your affectionate Uncle Screwtape. Again, <clears throat> quite a big chapter, but I didn't want to skip anything. So I want to call this one today, at the Screwtape Sermons, Hidden Idols. Hidden Idols. And from the very beginning of this letter that I started reading, Screwtape, the senior demon, He's talking to his apprentice, his nephew, and he says, we need to remain as demons in the shadows. He says, that's our rules right now from up above or down below, however you might want to say that. But he says, 
<clears throat> we need to stay invisible in the shadows. And he talks about how it's challenging for them to do so, and how there's negatives and pluses to being very obvious as devils, or negatives and pluses for being hidden as devils. But he goes on and he continues that they must work for the dark side in the shadows. So the very first thing we saw in this chapter is we need to stay in the shadows. But then he goes on and he says kind of something that's like shifting gears for us when we read this. He says, I haven't forgotten that you asked me earlier whether we should make this patient a pacifist or a patriot. Now remember, this is the middle of World War II. Things are really starting to get going now, right? And so if you were to pick any two things that were probably the hottest topics of the time, it would be these two parallel ideas, patriotism and pacifism, right? And so he says, which one should we make him? Which one's a good tool to ultimately bring this patient to hell? Well, that's a good question. If you don't know what, what the ideas of patriotism and pacifism are, let me go ahead and tell you here. Pacifism is that basically you believe that there is nothing that can justify violence. There is nothing that will justify war or violence in any circumstance. You must always be at peace. Then you have the complete polar opposite of that, right? Patriotism. What does patriotism mean? Well, it means the idea of no matter what the circumstance, no matter what war or what thing I have to do, I am going to stand strong and fight for my country. No matter what. So there's the idea of there's nothing I will do, peace must be always there, or there's nothing I won't do because my country. So basically, what he's asking is, what should I do to bring my human to hell? Which one's more effective? Did you catch what Screwtape goes on to say? They discuss about it for a while, and he says, there's a, these are our two key points, our two main topics. I mean, it's the middle of World War II. But what he says is, it doesn't matter which one he focuses on. Extreme devotion to either or will bring him to our side. Either of these ideas and extremes will turn into a focus that draws away devotion from God. They even bring up the idea of the early church, the scripture we started with this morning. The early church in Corinth had such an extreme about do we worship Paul or do we worship Apollos that they forgot that they worship God. They forgot what this whole church was about. And that's exactly what Screwtape is saying. He's saying us demons need to take that same thing. <laughs> what am I so passionate about that I forget that I'm worshiping God? That's exactly what they're trying to do. But remember, this is what Satan's working at in our lives to this day didn't just happen for the church in Corinth, and it didn't just happen in World War II. I think this still happens today. Because what I think Screwtape is talking about here is not Paul or Apollos or pacifism or patriotism, but it's idols. And it's hidden idols because they're remaining in the shadows. So if I had to sum up chapter 7, letter 7, it's talking about idols. So if the idols existed for the church in Corinth and for World War II, can I say boldly today that we still have to face idols? I think we can. I think, I think it's a struggle we all have to face. And on our faith journey, sometimes we will run into those idols trying to creep back in, trying to stand strong when we're trying to follow God. Satan's got a good hold on them. He uses the things of this world, right? And he wants to drag us to hell. He wants to bring us there. So maybe you have some idols in your life. Maybe yours is uh, pa uh, patriotism and pacifism. I don't know. Maybe you've picked one that you really want to stand strong on. Maybe it's not that easy. Maybe you're not just like the book. <laughs> maybe you have some other things that are idols that will hold you back. As Christians, I think we do. We struggle with maybe political affiliations. That's what this one was, right? But maybe what is an idol to you are things more like physical things, like wealth, status, possessions. Maybe it's how rich or poor you are because you want to change that or stay there. Maybe yours are more social idols. Maybe it's race or gender or mindset or outlook. But let me tell you, 
As Christians, we don't care what you think. Sounds pretty bold. As Christians, we don't care what you look like. It's pretty bold. As Christians, we don't care your status or power or wealth. Because as Christians, we should only really care about telling everyone from every place and status that God loves them. That he sent his son because he loved them to die on the cross so that he can love them forever in heaven instead of crying when they go to hell. So as Christians, we really don't care about all of those things. We really shouldn't care about anything except for a human that is loved by God. We want to share the gospel with them. That's the gospel summed up in like two minutes, right? We want to love them because God loved them, and we want to share the gospel with them. But man, we can still get caught up in these idols. Even when I said as Christians, we don't care, sometimes we do. Sometimes we accidentally start caring because Satan's working on an idol, right? And unfortunately, we're still stuck on him to this day sometimes. In the Old Testament, God reminded us, his people, and in us today, over and over again, that we should not be having idols. In Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, those are the two I put up there, he puts it straightforward, and this is a quote, right? You shall have no other gods before me. So even way back in the Old Testament, he's saying, guys, don't have any other gods before me. Reminding them all throughout the Old Testament, Exodus 20 Don't build anything or make anything that will become a god. Man, did they struggle with that over and over again, didn't they? (laughs) Don't build anything. Worship me and not this stuff. Exodus 23. Don't even talk about other gods like they're gods. Don't give them that credit because I am the only god you got to worry about. All the others are just nothing. But sadly, Satan's been using idols or other gods since there was man to worship any other gods. Unfortunately, it's true. And we can place anything above God if we're not careful. We can place it in our minds, in our hearts, right there on that top shelf. So easily to do. Satan tricks us so, so easily. But remember, God is jealous You ever heard anybody say that before and you wonder what that means? You're like, God is a jealous God. What does that mean? Well, I can tell you one way it means. He's jealous in the fact that there is nothing on that top shelf other than him. And if there is, he's not happy about it. He's jealous about it because he knows he wants to rule over your life. He wants to be the number one slot. He created the universe. He created our lives. Of course he deserves the top shelf. Isaiah chapter 44, I picked a few verses here, 6 through 11, so we get a little bit of context, so it'll be on two slides, okay? Isaiah 44, starting in verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare it and set it before me since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from the old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know, that they may be put to shame. Who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen, well, they're only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified, and they shall be put to shame together. There's a few key things that God is saying here in these scriptures. Right away, he says a bunch of ways to say, I am God over all, right? He says, I am the Lord, I'm the King of Israel, I'm the Lord of hosts. I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. He reminds his people again, hey, I'm the God that created everything. 
I'm the God of the universe and all the people and all the oxygen and all the animals and all the plants. There's nobody else that created all this. That's me. I am the first and the last, and besides me, there is no other God. So who can try and be like me? He goes talking about it in the prophet Isaiah. Who can even be like me? Oh, you're humans who make idols? Well, <laughs> those idols are pointless. It's basically what God goes on to say. Those idols do not stand a chance because they're made by human hands who are not God. I just described, I'm the only one. So what good is this thing made by a human who's not God? Well, it's empty. He talks about it in this last half. So we might be reading this and talking about idols and say, you know what? We're pretty good on that. We believe that there is one God and he is the God of the whole universe. There is no other God. But we don't build any idols. I mean, thank goodness we don't have any good blacksmiths in here that are living on that, right? We don't build any idols. We don't have to worry about it. Well, are we really okay? Are we good? Are we clear of idols just because we don't build any little golden calves? Unfortunately not. Unfortunately not, because when God said idols, he didn't just mean the physical metal things. He meant that same point, anything that we focus on that's not him. Anything, again, the same analogy goes above him on that top shelf. That would be an idol that's above him. So if we focus on something greater than him, more often than him, that's taking the idol place. And that's exactly what the demons were trying to provoke in their patient. In the screw tape letters, chapter 7, they said, it doesn't matter that it's not a physical golden calf. What do we have in our culture right now? Well, it's the World War II. All right, we've got two trains of thoughts on the war. Whichever one we want to pick, we'll use that and make it an idol. It's going to work if they do it right. And so for us today, whatever's in our culture, whatever's in our lives, ah, scaringly enough, Satan can use it and make it an idol. I think that's really true. But we shouldn't let that happen because it's a strong tactic of Satan and he's trying so, so hard. As Christians, we should be changed. I mean, Paul said it, we are new creations. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. I said this one a lot. This is one of my favorite verses. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So if we're a new creation and the old creation used to worship things of this world, whatever you wanted to pick was the top thing in your life. Well, if we're made new, the old has passed away and now the new has got on top. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So we have a new creation and a new purpose and a new life because of that. Back in January, we talked about the newness. And one of them was new creation. One of them was new life. So what does it look like to have a new life and live as new creations? Well, I would say the easiest way to describe it is right out of Scripture. It looks like living as light in a dark world. Light's in the darkness. Ephesians 5, 8 through 11. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So we live as a new life or a new light. We used to be darkness. That's what started right there in verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now we're changed. Now we're the light of the Lord. And what does it look like to walk as the children of the light? Well, we find what is good and right and true. And then what do we do in the inverse of that? Well, we try and discern what is pleasing to the Lord and take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Do you think I could classify idols as unfruitful works of darkness? seems like how Screwtape and uh, Wormwood are trying to use them in C.S. Lewis's book. Just unfruitful works of darkness that will be fruitful for them. So they're trying to use pacifism, patriotism, idols. So we should not be partaking in that, but rather discerning and saying, get out of here. 
Get out of here, unfruitful things, right? One of the greatest things we can do is continue to live that life that displays our loyalty, that displays we're new creations, walk in the light, show that we're Christians, report to God over and over, kind of like we are talking about in Bible class, that we are still working and living for Him, living His lights. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned from God, or you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. What's Paul write in the Thessalon- Thessalonian church? He says, I've heard about it, you church people in Thessalonia. You're living different. I've heard. I've heard you turned away from the idols and you started living for God, that God who sent his son who's going to redeem us and deliver us from all wrath to come. Basically, he said, I heard you guys are living in the light for Jesus. Thank you for getting out of the darkness and exposing the idols. This is the letter I want written about us as a church. This is the letter I want written about me as a Christian. Paul writes some really mean things sometimes to the churches, right? Corinth, get your act together, (laughs) right? But this is the one, two verses that I want written about me because I lived it, because I lived turned away from idols, walking in the light. These Christians were identified as that, as the ones that turned away from their idols and lived for God, and we should do the same. I think the biggest part of talking about idols for us modern Christians is just acknowledging that they still exist. Even though we do not have a golden calf on the wall or a golden Buddha over here, we still have idols. So we need to acknowledge and recognize that they still exist. And don't let Satan deceive us and tell us, oh, it's all good. He's hiding the idols on purpose. Because if they were in plain sight, remember like he's telling his nephew? Well, then we'd know then the tactic would have to be different because then we'd have to admit we're worshiping the idol. But they're hidden. They're hidden. So think about what might be in your life for idols. Just because it's not a golden calf doesn't mean it's not there. Maybe he's working exactly like he was working on the patient in the screw tape letters. Fictional, but maybe it's actually true for you. Maybe some of the idols that Satan is trying to place into your life is patriotism or pacifism. Maybe they have come into your life so much so that you think they're a part of your religion, a part of your relationship with God. Let me tell you what. Whichever camp you stand on on that one idol, doesn't matter. Because that's not what we're here for. We're here about the gospel and God's love. I bet for some of us, though, we deal with other ones. It's not those two specific ones exactly. I bet we do deal with some of these other hidden idols that really can take over our lives. It's hard. And just trying it to identify them is hard. But when we do identify them, how do we push them out of our lives? We refocus. Because that's all it is, is a focus trial, right? We, we can still have things that we care about. We just can't care about them more than God. We just can't place them on a higher stool or a higher shelf than God. Because that's exactly what Satan wants us to do. Instead of saying, I am a Christian with a faith in God, and this is something else about me, he wants me to say, this is something about me, and something else is I'm a Christian. Put it in the right order and fight those idols actively. That's the way we do it. That's the way we do it. Don't let Satan use any hidden idols, whether it be little things that are physical. This is the one I picked. Don't let an idol be the carpet in the church building because we don't have any. Also, don't let the idols be politics. Don't let the idols be anything. I say the funny things, like carpet in the church building, but do you know we can actually do that? Do you know we can care more about stupid physical things and relationship things and politics things than we do about God? It's okay to care about them. Just make sure the love of God is stronger than anything else. Thank you, guys.
What a great lesson, Harold. What a great theme and something to certainly consider and think about. And while I was sitting there listening, I thought, hidden idols in plain view. They are obvious if you look at them. So they're hidden, but they're in plain view for us all to see. Okay, do we have any joys or praises we'd like to mention this morning? Pat? Pat? So Cheryl's better? We're glad to hear that. Who else had a hand up? Uh, Ben and his cadets took home the first place trophy in a very uh, hard meet where the teams are really hard. They're hardcore cadets, and his his team took first place. Well, that's pretty impressive. Way to go, Ben and cadets. Yeah, who else has a joy or praise we'd like to mention this morning? Bible camp after hours, that would be a praise. Bible camp what? Applications are out. That's right. Bible camp applications are available if you, someone in your family or someone you know would like to attend. Harold? And they have a website, uh, Effective Yesterday, where you can just fill it on out, so... Sure. WyomingBibleCamp.org.com, one of them. Okay. Great. Courtney? Sorry, Craig. <laughs> Online, Kathy Lawrence said, a praise for the internet being available even so that she can watch online. Um, and then also that um, Charlotte and Fred are in good health after their COVID vaccines. And for me, 
our youth alley. It was really encouraging to see all those kiddos and yeah, all that that's good, good stuff. Okay. Any other joys or praises we want to mention this morning? How about prayer concerns? I have Terry Hyde. David said she's a little under the weather, so keep Terry in, in prayer. And Brian Nunn, Betty, Charlotte, Sandra Weber. Keep those in your prayers. Sherry? Also, I'd like to put Christy and family on the prayer list. We haven't seen them here for a good month, but maybe more. I'm concerned about her. I love her and love the family, and I just like prayers for them. Christy and family. Okay. Thank you. Um, Karen, over here. Uh, please pray for myself and Ben. We're, Ben's flying in Friday night, and we're going to begin the drive to Texas, South Texas, uh, early Saturday morning. So we'll miss y'all for about two weeks. Okay. Uh, we should keep the Sapuentes family in our prayers, uh, Pastor Joe passed away, so. Okay. Uh, Brian's brother and his wife are gonna be flying here this evening. His name's Lane. Just keep them in your prayers for safe travels. Okay. <laughs> Courtney. Online, um, Kathy Lawrence would like prayers for baby Destin. He's fighting his first cold, and it has gone to bronchitis and an ear infection. So prayers for Tosh as she is nursing Destin and the rest of her family back to health. Okay. And then I also... Um, uh, prayers for my grandma. They found out that she had um, breast cancer, and we're waiting on the doctors to get her in for a lumpectomy, so hurry up, doctors. <laughs> and then also, just to follow up on my friend from Lander, who goes to church in Lander, her brother-in-law. Um, it's been up and down, but last time I talked to her, he was on and up. So prayers that it just keeps on going. And that was a friend's brother-in-law? Okay. Okay. I had a prayer request this morning. The Belke family, uh, Vernon Belke, some of you may know him. He's been a Lutheran pastor and an educator in the area for several years. He passed away this last week. Would you repeat the last name? Vernon Belke. Belke. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Sherry? I wanted to um, ask for prayers for um, the explosion that happened in Shoshone. One of the people that was killed was the father of one of the boys I work with at school. Oh, boy. And so it was, it's a really, really rough situation. Last name is Mitchell. Okay. We sure will. Anyone else like to remind us of prayer requests? Okay. It's good to see everyone this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you, Father, for being the awesome God that you are. We thank you, Father, for giving us your word to follow. And in your word, Father, it clearly tells us in so many places that you are the one true God. And nothing, absolutely nothing in our life should 
take your place to draw our attention and our needs and our excitement than you, Father. We thank you so much for being the loving God that you are, for providing all that we need. And Father, oftentimes we forget that all that we need does come directly from you. And we thank you for that. Father, this morning all the names have been lifted up. We just pray that your will be done and uh, that you will take care of these needs. Father, we lift up Terry Hyde. Pray that you would help her to feel better for Betty and Charlotte and Sandra and Brian. Uh, Father, we, we're glad to hear that Cheryl is doing better and that she's back home. Father, we lift up uh, Christy Bennett and the kids, and we just pray, Father, that they're doing well and know that we miss them and, and hope to see them again soon. Father, we lift up Destin that's dealing with a cold, and we just pray that you would help him be able to fight through that and to restore his health. We lift up Courtney's grandma that has cancer, Father, and we just pray that those that would be treating her will be able to be successful because of your, your will and restore her health. We lift up uh, Courtney's friend's brother-in-law that's doing better, Father, and we just pray for continued healing there. Father, we lift up uh, Ben and the cadets that he instructs that recently had some competition. We're so glad to hear, Father, that they did well. And Father, we just hope that they will remember that all of those skills and abilities are gifts from you. Father, we lift up all those that may be traveling today or tomorrow or soon, like uh, Sandy and the kids coming back from the youth rally, like Ben and Karen that will be traveling back to Texas soon, for Brian's brother and his family, uh, Father, we just pray that you would watch over them and keep them safe in their journey. And Father, we lift up uh, Pastor Belke that recently passed away and Pastor Joe Sefuentes that did also. We pray, Father, that you would have mercy on them and that you would extend the compassion and comfort um, on their family and friends. Father, we we lift up those that were lost in an explosion in Shoshone the other day. We pray for them that they knew you, Father. We pray for their families, all of those left behind, friends and families. And we just pray, Father, that even though in such a terrible thing like this, that good will come from it, Father, and that all those touched by that will draw closer to you. Father, we thank you for another day, a beautiful spring day that we can come together and, and uh, fellowship to share the table, to hear the good and appropriate prayers from the table, Father, to help remind us and, and focus on what Jesus did for us and why he did what he did and the reward that we can have because of his actions. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the good news, and we pray, Father, that we can leave this morning being, being a light wherever we go, and that we, too, can spread the good news. Father, we thank you for another day, another time to, to meet, and especially we thank you for your word and your son. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.